Hello and welcome to another episode of the CG Garage. This is episode number 371 featuring Christoph Bolton and Richard Levin from Recom Farmhouse, a really, really interesting company that's been around for a while with some really interesting work that they've done. Uh, it was really cool having them on the podcast, Kristen. Tell me a little bit more what, what you thought about this. Yeah, this is a great one. Um, we kind of get to hear the background of how Recom Farmhouse started, um, was started by Christoph, and kind of now it's the go-to studio for automotive and product shots. Um, they've worked with like big names, uh, BMW, Mercedes-Benz, and Audi. Um, and then they also, we get to hear kind of the crazy fun adventures Christoph and Richard had um, in photography, kind of in the beginning of their careers. Um, and how their creative processes uh, right now and how they're kind of adapting to the new age of cinemagraphs. So that was fun. Um, and they also tell the story of what not to wear on shoots. So they learned early um, yep. the white. <laughs> Don't wear white because it reflects on everything. Absolutely yeah. right. And it's interesting because Recom Farmhouse is actually two companies that merge and one was Recom and one was Farmhouse. And so Christoph's company merged with the two of them. So it was kind of an interesting thing to hear about mm -hmm. that, which was really, really great talking to them. And they're really cool guys. So I was super so excited nice. to have them. <laughs> so, so nice. All right. Yeah. So it was really great to have them on. Uh, okay. Again, this uh, April is Autism Awareness Month. So Kristen, we got a, a, a announcements. We're doing something with the guys from Exceptional Mind. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so each week we are highlighting um, a student that is graduating. Um, and this week we have Blaine Harrington, um, and he will be graduating with an emphasis in VFX this June. Um, he has amazing skills in visual effects. Um, and if you'd like to see his work, you can check it out on his Creatively page, uh, which we will link to this podcast, uh, the show notes, as long as along with his reel. So you will be playing it right after this intro uh, before our actual podcast starts. So you can see it there or check it out on the podcast page. And we're just trying to help the students kind of find jobs after they graduate. And if you would like to learn more about Exceptional Minds, you can visit exceptional-minds.org and find more about this great organization. Yeah, absolutely. They're really great. Uh, I think we mentioned it last week. Exceptional Minds is a school that helps uh, people that are uh, on the autism spectrum uh, be trained in visual effects or motion graphics or animation and uh, helps them out and figure, you know, gives them the proper training. And then what they also do is for people who want to hire them, they also train those people in terms of best ways of working with people on the spectrum and, and best practices. So it's a really great organization. We're super happy to help them. And of course, we thought because it is uh, autism awareness, month uh, it would be great to feature some of these things so uh, so yeah so really great to do that uh okay we have a couple of events going on Kristen. what's going on yeah, so the first one is going to be on April 21st. It's the Chaos Campus live show, and it will be episode three. Nico will have uh, guest Sarah Colata on, who is the host of the Arc Talk Tank. Um, and they'll just discuss uh, upcoming business of architecture conference and also the importance of investing in education how blockchain tech and NFTs influence the industry and a lot more. So you can find that out at chaos.com slash events and click on the Chaos Campus Live Show episode three to find out more. And then on May 4th, I think it's actually the third through the fifth, FMX will be happening, but on May 4th, Chaos will be there having a booth um, and we'll host a panel discussion on the challenges of creating high-end VFX for episodic TV. So... Sign up Perfect. on chaos.com <laughs> slash events as well. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. That's great. And we do have uh, we do have a, a little bit of product news as well. Not a little bit, actually big product news. Uh, Chaos Corona 8 is out this week or it came out last week, but it's really exciting. Lots of new updates for our 3ds Max and Cinema 4D users, including some, uh, including Chaos Scatter, Chaos Cosmos, Decals, Slicer, and a whole lot more. So Corona is big deal for you guys, you Corona users. Be excited that you guys can get uh, Corona 8. That's out. Um, and, uh, that's about it. If people want to know more about the podcast, where can I go, Kristen? You can go to facebook.com slash CG garage podcast or chaos.com slash CG garage. And if you'd like to watch us go to chaos or go to youtube.com slash chaos group TV. Perfect. And if you have any ideas about podcasts or anything else, uh, please email us labs at chaosgroup.com. We'd love to hear your feedback or your ideas 
uh, it'd be great to do that. Uh, so before, like we said before, uh, before, if you're watching the video form of this podcast, you will be seeing uh, Blaine Harrington's reel from Exceptional Minds. We're going to do that to help the guys out at Exceptional Minds and hopefully give Blaine some exposure. Uh, and then after that, we will go on to the to episode 371 with Christoph Bolton and Richard Levine from Recom Farmhouse. Welcome to another CG Garage, where the Chaos Group talks. You'll know it's over when the last bucket drops. We're gonna fire off rays in high dynamic range. We know that ambient occlusion is passe. Global illumination won't lead you astray. And while image-based lighting is really swell, you need to make sure everything has for now. Okay. Well, before I usually like to go into backgrounds of people real quick, but before we even get into that, I'd like to give people a bit of an understanding about Recom and and, and Farmhouse Recom Farmhouse and a little bit about the company and what that's about. And then we can get into a little bit about your own personal involvement in it. What what can you guys tell me about the company and what it is? Who wants who wants to start on this one? I'll let you go, Chris. Yeah, cool. Um, I mean, Recom, <clears throat> you want the short version or the long version? <laughs> Whichever one you have, we have an hour, so we have plenty of time. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, I think Recom started probably around 30 years ago in, in Germany, in, in Stuttgart, um, as a more, uh, repro photographic, um, business, uh, before computers, um, where composite things were still done um, by cutting things out, masking slide film out, putting masks on, and then having big repro photography cameras to to um, do copies of it. And then when it was sent out to magazines, there were still like lots of copies of the same eight by ten inch transparency that had to be shipped out. And um, I think that's how um, at the time uh, Thomas Al Frank and Micha Fred started. And then when the first computers came um, really quickly, they went to the bank and said, like, okay, we want one of these machines, which at the time was like half a million. And um, it must have been super scary. And they were working basically 24-7, sleeping under the machines sometimes to just like pay that thing off. But there were very few of them around. It was lots of high-end fashion retouching then and um, where they had the budget to, to pay for this um, equipment, basically. And um, so that's they started really early on with with digital and were always at the forefront since. And then about I started, what year was this approximately? Just to give people an idea about what year were they starting to go digital? Um, that would have been the late eighties, I would say. Okay, yeah, yeah somewhere I around I remember, there. I remember seeing a photo recently. Was it eighty six with? Uh... With Tommy and his mullet. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, stuff. exactly. Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Under the machine. Cigarette ads back then as well. Lots of cigarette ads. They had the budget and it all had mm -hmm. to look mighty glamorous. And, yeah. And, um, and then I, on the other hand, started originally more as a photographer. And, um, then somehow once I moved to London, got into the whole, um, assistant side of things and got pushed into the digital side for photographers who didn't have the budget for personal work to, hire the big studios and then that took off and I started eventually um, my own post-production business called Farmhouse Post and then I met at some point the Recom guys at a point when I realized when CGI started that I really um, was struggling to compete with the bigger houses because I couldn't even get the cut data from car manufacturers to produce portfolio work. 
So we ended up modeling our own three series BMW and NERPS back then. I had like a freelance CG artist who was helping me with that. And it was all really painful. And, um, I, I realized I really needed a stronger partner. And I met the guys at a conference in Germany and, um, we got on super well and they invited me and, um, then they became shareholders in, in Farmhouse Post and hence the, yeah, slightly odd name, Recom Farmhouse. <laughs> Where still lots of that's, people that's ask the me, merger. it's like, that why, happened. yeah, <laughs> why so is when, it called when, Recom Farmhouse? <laughs> okay. Well, when, 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 uh, when was that merger? When did that, that happen? That was probably around 2008, 2009. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what about you, Richard? How did you get involved in, in, in the, hmm. in the, <laughs> in Recom? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's more like a happen, happenstance and, um, yeah, kind of just kind of luck and fell into it. But, um, I started, I was kind of my best skill at school was art. So that was kind of the direction that I was going and I was kind of into, into movies and games and wanted to get into, into that side of things. And, went to university and studied there but it was kind of not as great a course as it was advertised it was it was kind of like linked with it with ea games and um EA, yeah ea games and we went to their headquarters uh, like the first week and it was like oh this is going to be really great and, and then it sort of turned out that our professor didn't really know what he was doing or it was just it was too much for him <clears throat> and he kind of left like a year and a half into into our sort of studies and we were kind of left in the lurch a bit, but then um, uh, a sort of new lecturer came in, Alan Postings, and he was, he'd was he studied at Noman and he was like kind mm -hmm. of been, been working in the industry. And we didn't really know what Noman was at the time. And we still hadn't really even started using like Maya and doing 3D stuff on this course yet. And um, yeah, he kind of sort of guided us and helped us. And but he was kind of helping the third years with their like final projects so we kind of yeah got a little bit of of good guidance from him in that in that sort of second year and then the third year was yeah was was really good sort of education with him and he had access to like the Noman DVDs and yeah so we were watching those and kind of getting more into that side and we kind of finished the the, the studies and I kind of still didn't what school really was know. this by the way Oh, uh, this, it was only a small school. It was, it was called, at the time, it was called the Kent Institute of Art and Design, which was, mm -hmm. yeah, in Kent in, in England. Um, just a small art college, like, yeah, very small. I wanted to get to go into, go to uh, Bournemouth University, which was mm -hmm. like a big, bigger school, but the 3D course needed or wanted you to have studied maths. And I was not very good at maths and I didn't do an A level in maths. And, uh, so it wasn't, it wasn't for me. And, um, and it worked out in the end, but uh, yeah, I finished finished uh, my uni course, and and only really had like a year of kind of introductory training to stuff. So I still wasn't really clear, and there was no pathway kind of in of how we get into the industry and what where to go from there. But one of the people had mentioned, obviously, Noman, and uh, it was too expensive, and in LA, and it was uh, not really going to be possible. But there was uh, Escape Studios which was kind mm. of like the similar thing to Noman in, in London. And um, fortunately with some help from my parents, uh, yeah, kind of, I got enrolled into, into that course and it was like a six month, like comprehensive visual effects course of like three months of doing 2d work and three months of 3d work. And um, yeah, it was, it was basically amazing just meeting the, the right sort of people and being taught by the, the right sort of people. Um, yeah, like Mark Pinero was was my like uh, compositing um, tutor, and he was like tremendous and gave all these great talks like at the morning of every class of like the theory behind compositing and showing like behind the scenes of DVDs of all the films and breaking down all the shots and it was yeah it was a great education in 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 that regards and um, yeah kind of he was the one that sort of led me into my next thing was once that finished i kind of helped started to helping him on a, a short film that he was producing um and i was ended up somehow being like the, doing the, all the lighting for that film and i, I didn't really know what, what i was doing at the time really because it was just me and just like some other artists who were doing some animation and and other things but i kind of yeah just working out what i was doing on on the job and it was the director of that short film who was renting studio space 
in the same studio, shared studio as Christoph. So basically she had the next desk to Christoph and um, Christoph was like obviously trying to learn himself and was hiring some 3D artists uh, at the time. And he, he asked her, do you have any recommendations for someone doing lighting and rendering, I guess. And then I got this weird email from this German guy sending me cars and hadn't even considered <laughs> what that was or what that career kind of was doing, like rendering for, for stills or for, for cars. And and right. I was like, I mean, yeah, there's no no problem. Let's go meet him in this warehouse in Hackney. <laughs> and um, it was all pretty run yeah, down, yeah. creative yeah, space, down. but yeah, very creative, <laughs> cool space. But it was like, yeah, in the back streets of uh, of East London in Hackney, and um, yeah, went to go meet him, and yeah, kind of like the rest is history. <laughs> and uh, nice. yeah, joined, started working with him, and it was just just like, yeah, you can do. You can do more working with with him as a two man band. You know, I was from start to finish on a project, uh, dealing with clients, doing estimates, and doing the three D work, and seeing it all the way sort of to the end. Well, Christoph was doing the the retouching at the time, but it was yeah, yeah. could do a lot more and have yeah, see a lot more of the shot and stuff than you would if I was doing things in in film and just doing clean up or roto or camera tracking at the time which which what it was and um yeah yeah it was it was all kind of exciting and and fun and, and then when he partnered with recon it was like okay i went to germany to to train at, at their studios for like a month or so and yeah there was a bigger really nice um like headquarters there in stuttgart and um it was all it was all great and a great spirit of people and yeah, it was it was fantastic, and I kind of never wanted to leave. Basically, and then, yeah, still. still so you you after. joined the company before the merger. Yeah, we're just a, maybe a year or so before, I think. Mm -hmm. So okay. yeah, I think I joined two thousand and six, two thousand seven. Uh, yeah, okay. maybe something like that. Maybe something. Like yeah, two thousand and yeah, two thousand eight. Yeah. I can't really fully remember. My very first employee, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was your very first employee. employee. Yeah, nice. yeah, yeah, yeah. Employee number one. Yeah. Wow. And that's thing awesome. is that I never. The thing is that I never really. I was never planning to start a company. Really, it's like when the whole CGI thing started. I was like, mm, okay, I know how to shoot cars. I know how to retouch them. Um, doing them in CGI computer. It's just like to light them and set up the shots. That's that's going to be my thing. And I started learning Maya. And just after a month, I was just like no way <laughs> I, yeah. I really need some help here and then first i had a freelance artist and then i came across richard somehow and it was yeah out of desperation that i really needed help because <laughs> maya was <laughs> way too deep for me and um and also back then you know there was no youtube there were no um tutorials around the whole infrastructure um it was everything how to shoot hdr spheres um, image based lighting that was all still really early days and, um, everything, every little bit of knowledge you had to work really hard by trial and error to figure out how to do stuff. Yeah. And if you found the Nomen book, DVDs I... were like the big resource back then, like that was the big thing. Mm, right? yeah, that, yeah. Yeah. And then there was some digital tutors early, early yep. doors. I remember mm -hmm. those, um, mm -hmm. like really poor resolution. I mean, I don't think mm -hmm. the Nomen ones were that higher either, but. Yeah, they were pretty like good. Four, I did. The, four, I did two. Yeah. Of, yeah, I remember your uh, yeah your ones. As my well. my viewing yeah. ones, but they were they were basic. They were they were DVDs, right? So they were not HD. So it's SD exactly, quality. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, but, but no, uh, I mean, great at the time. I mean, huge resource at the time. Yeah, so it was that, and yeah. yeah, CG Talk forum, just hours and hours mm -hmm. reading. So just and, and trying to figure out questions something. and yep, <laughs> yeah. But what was what was huge? I mean, so what was huge for us was. The merger um, with Recom because they mm -hmm. had they had purchased. Um, you remember the, the Sphere on camera? Oh yes, um, Chris, of course. Yes, the capturing domes. So that was a big thing. But I'm not, not sure a lot of people knew that they had also created a um, a lighting and rendering package in terms of like shaders and lighting. Um, mm -hmm. I do remember. And they had uh, an important sampled IBL dome, which was like unheard of really at the time um mm -hmm. like the ibl in mental ray at the time and, and like the, the out of the box was just like you had to use with global illumination so if it hit a hot spot it would be like you know 
just random bright lights kind it of. Was lucky, right. It was lucky, but it never there. looked like reality. Yeah. But it was it was okay. So the sphere on camera, I do remember. So it was it was like one of those first like bzzz cameras that would just yeah, do a split scan. Like, yeah, exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Just like right. a single yeah. line of, of yeah, um, I mean, CCDs just... that was scanning. Yeah. So wherever <laughs> the sun was, you had this super bright vertical line going through yeah, the entire that's... image. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Uh, but I do remember also, uh, you're right. So did the importance, didn't it just basically just make a series of spotlights, but it would do them by importance sampling, wasn't it? How did it, how did uh, it work? Not for the sphere on IPO, I don't think. I think it was after that. Like, I think before that, maybe it had, but I think it had gone past that point at that, yeah. at that time. So it was kind of... Um, Kind of like basically what the the, the V ray uh, dome light was eventually once it, it mm -hmm. got important sampling. Um, so it was like it was incredible, and and we were using they had uh, BRDF scanned car paints, so we would get they the car did. paint, we would send it to the Sphere on team, and they would scan it with like a BTF scanner, and it was just like wow, just like literally drag drag and drop your materials on and and your IBL and we were seeing like fantastic results out of the gate and it was a huge leap for us and like shadow capture yeah. uh, material and, and yeah. things that just didn't exist out of the shelves on other rendering yeah. packages at, at the time mm. and um, yeah it took a while for I think before we saw it in V-Ray I mean V-Ray for Maya wasn't out then I don't think I think V-Ray for Maya came around 2008 2008 9 yeah 8 9 10 mm -hmm. so yeah, I think in two thousand and seven, two thousand and eight, it was um, it was a big thing for us. So I felt like our work tremendously increased at that at that point. So you guys yeah. were always in Maya then. So you guys, yeah, for, sort of yeah, because I had studied Maya, so it was yeah, right. Maya and Mental Ray, and the German guys were uh, Maya and Mental Ray at the, at the mm -hmm. time. So yeah. Right. it was yeah, quite the kind of the battle, especially on other projects where yeah. We were trying to render other things or the motion blur and, sure. and, and things like that that were a, a struggle. But um, yeah, I think our work really stood out at that point still. So it was um, it was still really really good for us. And uh, right, it wasn't until later down the line that kind of yeah, mental ray was phasing out and uh, we transitioned to, to other renderers. One obviously being V Ray, but right, yeah, we mm -hmm. kind of kind of used some other renderers as well. <laughs> sure. uh, so, so Christoph, you had a, you said your background is in photography, right? Mm -hmm. So, so what, what, what was your, what was your passion for photography? How did that, that, that happen? Um, I mean, I had started at school already, I think, um, a little bit from the dark room actually, because there was, we had a dark room at school, black and white dark room. And I always thought that was really fascinating, um, what's going on in there. Just this room of like, you know, with a red light and some magic is happening there. And it's, it's still up to today. I find it fascinating that you have a blank piece of paper, you put it under the lens and then you put it into some chemical and by magic, this image appeared. And, and then the whole photography, the creative side of things, this mix of technology and, and creativity somehow. I was always really bad at drawing, but I always liked art somehow. So that kind of was, was good for me that I don't have, didn't have to draw anything, um, but could still be creative. And, um, yeah, started at school. And then after school, I just, I just didn't have a clue what to do. I was, I was really quite clueless. And that was my only idea. It was my hobby. And, um, then I applied with one studio which happened to be it was like catalog photography basically but it was a huge one that had like 13 studios under one roof and as an a, apprentice in, in germany it's this apprenticeship system where you're there for three years or two and a half years and part of the time you're with a photography studio the other part you go to a school and learn the theory and um as an apprentice in the studio you were like two months with this photographer, two months with that photographer and so on. And so you went from food and drinks photography to huge set builds to fashion photography. And so as you made your rounds through the studio to all the different photographers, you could take away so much knowledge there. Um, even though it wasn't necessarily high level um, photography, they still had amazing resources in terms of equipment. And um, if you just were smart and just like, look what every photographer had figured out for themselves and just asked as many questions as you could and use all this equipment. They were quite generous with using all this equipment for um, your personal work and for the assignments that you had to do for school. Um, 
it just yeah I learned a crazy amount there yeah, it was it was really good actually and then after that um yeah I stayed in Bremen a little bit doing odd jobs taking pictures for jewelry and hotels and old people's homes and dominatrixes and just quite a wild mix actually which gets okay. you around it's it's it's, it's interesting uh -huh. um but then i just yeah i always liked the idea also about like with photography photography you can travel and then i just um got a job with All this right. um photographer in hamburg who's a car photographer billy von recklinghausen really talented Uh, car photographer at the time and um, he never shot in the studio we actually I think in the three years that I was with him and um, we never even shot in Germany it was only ever abroad and you that was yeah fantastic because one month you're in New Zealand and then Namibia and then lots of LA as well and lots of southern Europe and um, yeah I got really hooked on that. And even though before then I got a little bit into this whole Photoshop thing at that catalog business where they had like the first digital camera where you had like this, um, big wheel in front of the lens with like the, um, red, green and blue colors. So you had to take a picture for F with every single filter in there that was then merged together to get your, um, digital image and, um, started to use a little bit of Photoshop at the time. Um, while I was working then and traveling with this car photographer, I just, yeah, didn't follow that Photoshop side of things at all anymore. And it was only really when I came to London and, um, started assisting for some good photographers, as I said, then I got a little bit pushed into that direction and then it worked out quite well. And then the photographer said, um, Hey, I've got a big campaign coming up now. Why don't you do my campaigns as well? And not just the portfolio work. And, um, I was, it was pretty nerve wracking because I was an absolute amateur, um, totally self taught. Um, I didn't really know like CMYK conversions. How do you convert something to CMYK put out to transparency? I, I didn't know any of that stuff. And, um, it definitely was nerve wracking and I definitely screwed up some bits as well, but he trusted me. And, um, I think the results, it, it did work out for him as well. And it gave him the opportunity to, come up with completely new ways of taking pictures because suddenly there was a retoucher with him all the time and we were in the studio and if you just I remember we had this just like a Gucci sandal and oh what can we do with light and then you have one light from um, where you just light it from that side then again from that side but always in the middle of the shoe and so you had all these different lighting position and it looked like in the end you could comp it all together and the shoe was lit from the inside so you could do all these impossible pictures somehow And I remember he bought a drum scanner at the time. And um, so we could straight away, there was a, um E6 lab next door. So we could just like um, really quickly get the film developed, scan it, do some tests. And then we could just um, play and develop our techniques that way. And I think for him and for me, it was just, yeah, a great learning curve. And then that fed into all the advertising jobs. And then we got some really big, um, the launch campaign for the Hammer H2 when it when it came out, this yeah. big Tonka, Tonka toy truck. Um, yeah. <laughs> we got that one. And then, yeah, that was, yeah, suddenly also really big money because he paid me the same money that he would have otherwise paid those huge um, post-production houses. And I had no overheads whatsoever. <laughs> I just like, I was even using his computer in his studio. And um, so the money thing came in then as well, where I suddenly realized like, oh, this can actually be really lucrative. Right. Even up till today, I I still have never made that much money again as I was making <laughs> back in those days. Um, well, and it allows you to start a company now, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's still it was so as a as a single freelancer um, getting company rates, corporate rates um, without any right. overheads. It's just yeah, you can't match that really. Right. Um, but um, I was also working seven days a week, and I think it was after after half a year, I was quite burnt out. I remember it was it was quite intense, but it was a, it was a great time. And then also back then, advertising was a bit more glamorous as well, where you just everything's business class and staying at the Chateau Maman, and it was like it was a it was a good life, really. I have to say. <laughs> Yeah, and, um, well, we can get into a little bit about how advertising has changed over the years, but yeah. <laughs> I'm curious a little bit about, uh, I used to work in, you know, did commercial work for a long time and car commercials were a big deal, right? Yeah. So I used to do yeah. CG car commercials quite a bit. I mean, mm -hmm. that's a very specialized way of photography, you know, of 
photographing things. Um, yeah. And, and I think the number one thing that you get, that people get wrong when they do a CG car is they, they make it too reflective. Like it looks mm -hmm. like a Christmas ornament. <laughs> yeah. It's tempting, isn't it? <laughs> it's very tempting. Yeah. So, uh, I think that's one of the things that, but, but understanding how a car is photographed, it was very interesting to, to, to see that it's not, there is a very, there's a lot of quote unquote rules that people observe mm -hmm. when they do photography. What are some of the things that you, that you observe when you're photographing a car or rendering a car? <laughs> um, I mean, what's one of the rules? I mean, I don't know. I've, I feel like today there's less and less rules, um, where I think back then you were trying to make everything so polished and, and perfect. Um, and I remember back then, especially like talking, for example, about the summer campaign where we, we shot the car in white sands, but then with flash as well, um, to give it this, um, serial look. And, but then we also went to the studio with the same camera angle and shot the car again in the studio, really getting like the lighting 100% perfect and then comping it all together. And it was something that at the time, it was something completely new and it hadn't been done like this before. And, and people were really into it. But if you now look at those images, it looks totally CG. Um, because you are making things so perfect. And I think in CGI today, it's much more of playing with shadows and having some grit in there. And I think a lot of clients realize that as well. Um, like a lot of work that we do with, with Mercedes as well with the agency, Anthony, it's just like just, yeah, a lot of reality and grit and you can, you can break a lot of rules. And now at a point where it's just like, okay, it doesn't even matter if it looks a little bit CG and hyper real, it just like go to like some nineties look where you just, um, go away from like, let's not have depth of field maybe and, um, go a little bit more. Um, yeah, if it can even look a little bit like, um, an unreal rendering or a little bit gamey and just really breaking all the rule books up somehow. And I think that's always, you're always trying to find something, the next thing in, in advertising as well. And it's, uh, I think, yeah, just quite often about dumping rules and what sure. you learned, um, 10 years ago is this, um, might not apply at all today anymore. And so I don't, I find it, especially when you work with so many different photographers, um, every photographer has a completely different way of working with a car. And, um, that's one of the interesting things as well that, um, you work in so many different styles and so many philosophic approaches to car photography as well, or to product photography that I feel like I wouldn't say any rules. Um, it's, um, the only thing, yes, don't have the sun behind the camera behind you. That's, that usually still looks bad. If you put a flash on the camera from the camera, that can look cool again. But yeah, don't have the, don't have the sun behind the camera. That's, that never looks good. But that's pretty much it, I'd say. <laughs> Well, that's interesting. I mean, Richard. I mean, obviously, you know, you 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 started off right in, in CG, and then you you obviously when you hooked up with Christoph, you saw that he, you know, he's a photographer. So you must have learned quite a bit yeah, was, from his photography. To, yeah, it's to, a huge huge learning learning curve and jump because we still really hadn't kind of been taught that on our side on the CG sides. Um, even for the lighting and rendering, it's kind of that theory side and the photography side was still lacking um, in my education. So it was definitely, um, yeah, really good um, to be linking with, with Christoph and learning from him and all of that. And and also just getting the chance to to be on set at such an early point in my career. Cause like we kind of, yeah, we were doing big projects and then we were, I was being asked to go on set and do like previews on set. And I hadn't even been on a shoot properly before. So it was kind of, yeah, learning things like that on, as I'm as I'm going and yeah my first my first onset experience was quite quite funny um first was it, we were in LA and it was like really hot so I wore white because I don't want to be sweating and like hot and you just don't wear white on a, on a shoot because you can't see your, your monitor because mm -hmm. you'll be reflecting in it <laughs> you also reflect into the car um, right. So that was my first one. Everyone's looking at me like everyone's wearing black and I'm in white. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then uh, we had I had like a cube to put down onto the into the scene for like a measurement of like where the where the CG car would be. And they hadn't really blocked off the roads properly or the lane. And so I put the cube cube down, and this taxi has swerved into the lane. 
and yeah. just smashed the cube and it's almost <laughs> struck a a person walking like an older older lady on the on the side of the street and I'm wow. like the cube's dent this is my my first HDR dome I'm getting ready to, to shoot <laughs> and like the first shot of the day and I'm like the cube's the cube's dented and <laughs> this is a great start and then my laptop broke midway through the shoot um like the graphics card died and i had to use like the the uh the motorhome driver's laptop which was just a complete random <laughs> like pc laptop and um oh god <laughs> it was a it sounds like disaster. a nightmare <laughs> i mean I, I made it all work and i was like up until yeah i didn't sleep that one night when i was trying to like get his laptop sorted and like set up all the all the software and, and everything and then the art director was like screaming at me saying you don't like you don't care about this project and it was like a complete opposite i was doing everything to make it work for everything and um they brought in, brought in some guy that they knew a cg guy to cover for me because they thought i couldn't handle it <laughs> and yeah. um, i'm not even sure if i told crystal of this no, oh, there's, yeah, there's yeah. quite a few bits that I, I don't know about um, this. I know some of them, but not the whole yeah. thing. No, and, uh, but anyway, he kept he that from in, me. Like, and he came and brought in like his, his workstation, like a big PC, and he was using uh, 3DS Max and V-Ray, but he could only do like grayscale car and um, like previs. And I was like on this guy's crappy PC laptop doing like IPR rendering with like this great ibl lighting and and stuff and i was like look what can i can do on this and you're doing this and you've got this guy and uh they realized that yeah they didn't didn't need him and i was fine to finish out on the like the photographer had a spare laptop that i ended up using but um yeah it was all pretty chaotic and crazy and like yeah um a really good good learning point <laughs> and uh, yeah yeah kind of I've made everything, well, that's cool. Everything that's cool. That. I mean, yeah, you, when you learned on under pressure like that, it's pretty good, actually. Sometimes yeah. it's gonna be. But hard, what I, but. I mean, going back to like the whole photography side is, we we get given um, from quite a lot of clients like angle pyramids where they have like the designers have set the angles that they like uh, based on the you know on the design of the car that we kind of have to match to, and it's kind of crazy how many of those all end up being like super long lenses, like your yeah, feet and feet away from the car. So the car, you know, looks like it's orthographic almost. And um, they don't take into account where the car would be on a location and what you actually want to see around it. So it's, um, there's definitely a lot of kind of cheating involved and, and kind of pushing yeah. the client to go away from maybe what they were initially hoping for in terms of uh, an angle on the car and saying, look, this makes a lot more sense. It feels a lot more natural to the environment, and yeah, let's let's go with let's go, go a little bit shorter on the lens and stuff like that. And right, yeah, and For also sure. a lot of playing. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 Christoph and and both both of you guys. I mean, you know, I like I said, I was kind of doing car car commercial stuff around. 2006 as well i was doing a bunch of those that work and like you said it was a different days in advertising car commercials were million two million dollar commercials mm -hmm. you know those are expensive things and they were treated yeah. like luxury and um and that was very different i mean today i mean i've been out of it for a while but I mean, if, I, if i thought about like being in that world today it would be very different it's a it's today is an instagram world today is uh, you know there's a everyone everyone's got a camera in their pocket right uh, and it's it's kind of a different experience of how you do things. I mean, how have you noticed those changes, and how has it affected the kind of work that you guys do and the kind of campaigns that you guys do? Mm, I guess we're also lucky that we still get those jobs where there is a bit of a budget and where people want to do a big campaign. We tend to get a fair bit of those jobs as well. Um, sure. But, of course, there is a lot less print work now um then there used to be also like back then for every new car model there used to be a big brochure with lots of shots and i think that has become a lot less now as well um and i think in general there is a lot more motion now that's the one thing that i think the last two years i think it has or three years it has really changed a lot where there is barely any print job now where there is not a motion part to it 
where in the past it used to be maybe in the beginning, okay, there's a little bit of a cinema graph or something that maybe needs to move a little bit, but that is changing a lot now where like all the billboards outside, they're animated and the bus shelters, they're all LEDs and, um, and print magazines is less and less. So it's, I think anything needs to be moving as well these days. And quite often now these, these, before it was that the print kind of was still dictating the motion assets, but that is changing. There's jobs now where this, these motion assets on for websites and for digital billboards, they are the more important ones. And then we have to do a high risk print image somewhere out of those motion assets as well. So the dominance is changing more and more, not in every job, but it's just like on average, somehow it's, it's basically shifting towards, um, yeah there is not a single job without motion anymore. And before there was a strict division between um, print and the commercial side of things, and then maybe press films somewhere. And um, and then there was print with the cinema graphs. And, but there is this, you can't tell them apart anymore from a print ad to like a high end commercial. There is every single gap of what's possible in between it's, it's possible. So you can't sometimes tell which way the jobs are coming together and what leads is the photographer leading or is the director leading or is it, where is it merging? And it's, it's quite interesting um, where you then for every single job, sometimes when you're pitching for it, you think like, okay, this is a print job and there's a little bit of emotion. And it's only while you edit, you kind of learn, Oh, hang on. No, that's not what they have in mind. They just think the complete opposite or that it changes during a project as well, because it's, um it's, everything's in flux somehow and the same way the whole the jobs are coming together where in the past it was just pretty much always like we have a photographer the photographer hires us doing post-production doing the retouching and the agency hires the photographer and the client hires the agency and now the jobs come from car clients directly from agencies from photographers everything is just mixing and it's not interesting these, yeah there these was always an agency not as cut yeah there was always an agency that would hi- was hired, so you know I'd always work with Saatchi or whatever, you know, yeah. to do this stuff. Yeah. That's yeah. not the case anymore. Yeah, I think yeah. I mean Tesla changed that, I, I guess, kind of in a way where yeah, they never employed a, an agency, I don't think, or they were doing a lot of. Uh, Tesla doesn't advertise. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, in that way, yeah, I guess. Um, yeah, they so, they, yeah, they, 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 they rely on the news to do all their advertising for them. <laughs> um, yeah, true. But but it's what's interesting. But you know, it's a, I find it fascinating because you know you mentioned like motion is more important, and it was. You're right. It was like a car f- photography or a 36 second advertisement in there. But now you you can actually have like like a moving still of some kind. It's like two second, three second Instagram something. And so, yeah. how is that? Ha- have you? Have you guys had to rethink about how you do those things? And like, is that a new way of, of thinking about cars or photography and like action all of a sudden is a little bit different than the, the act of photography or how do you incorporate those two things? I think, yeah, you constantly have to change how you think about it, but it's, again, it's not like you learn and it's just like, um, this is how you do it now. It's just like, it feels like every single job you have to rethink again how they're doing it because then because they have to spread their budget now over so many different output channels of course right. there is like for each individual assets there's less money so they're trying to it's really trying to find efficient ways of giving the client as much value as possible for the budget that they have it's the same about i mean formats have gone crazy where before you had like well you had your maybe your your landscape and maybe you were cropping in to do like a single page ad out of it. But now it's just like banners like this, banners like this and squares and everything has to work. And they want to be still able to zoom in on the car and have the car at 10,000 pixels wide where, you know, it's um right. when you then extrapolate that to how big a single print image is like sometimes, yeah, like we had recently a job where the client asked for 30,000 pixel um images um every single one of them so they could crop into the car by itself as well and um and then for all these motion assets um sometimes it's a still image i remember we did for jaguar where then we just like cut out the individual um 
layers, um, mm -hmm. like the foreground, um, a talent, the car and the background. And then was just doing some focus wrecking in between and after effects. And that was like the, the social that media asset basically. Yeah. And it's like all these ideas somehow, how can we just like in a simple way, we have a still image. How can you do something? Um, that also doesn't take too much bandwidth when you have it online and that it can be something that doesn't need to be a full, um, full flung film. It's just something that can repeat, that can loop as well. And that is something yeah. as you browse through a website, that's something that's playing and looks pleasant and something interesting and something that's different. And it's on every single job you go again. Okay. All right. Okay. If, if we had unlimited budget, I knew exactly how we would do this, but okay. We have right. these resources. Okay. How can you do it? And what's the best way sure. of solving this? And it's every single job is like, again, and you, yeah, learning. Well, that sounds very exciting in a creative way. <laughs> so it you, is. Yeah. And, and, and in a certain way, you know, limitations, I mean, we, we hate limitations, but in a way, yes, they, it does work. Limitations, they do make you creative to a certain degree. Yes, but then, of course, quite, for themselves, so. yeah, but quite often it's like, okay, it's, um, this, in the end, it is really compromised because, yes, it doesn't look that great because we didn't really have the resources to do it properly. I mean, that happens quite a lot as well. So it's, mm -hmm. it can be exciting, but sometimes, yeah. It's not. It's mm -hmm. a bit frustrating as well. Well, you mentioned like, uh, thirty-two thousand yeah. pixel mm -hmm. rendering. So, how how do you guys like? Obviously, now you're doing massive, massive renderings. Are you guys using distributed rendering? How are you guys mm -hmm. uh, doing some of those things? Yeah, distributed rendering. Um, it's a big yeah. thing. Um, yeah, I mean, we're still waiting for it with uh, V-Ray Cloud and. Uh, since day one of V-Ray Cloud, I've been asking for it, um, and the guys know because I keep testing them. Um, oh, distributed rendering on the cloud. On, on yeah. the on the yeah with uh -huh. V-Ray Cloud, um, but we do it with like yeah with AWS and um, have to do it ourselves uh, and create our own little system when we when we need to, and especially that's tough for like interiors with global illumination and, and you know fine quality, high resolution. Yeah, you need to churn a lot. You need to put a lot of power towards it. But yeah, it's always been um, yeah distributed rendering, and it was a lot harder back in the day with uh, with Mental Ray, but it was made easier with uh, with V Ray and the, and the right. system there. And yeah, other uh, other renderers either do or don't have support for that. And um, yeah, so it's it's definitely a a battle depending on what what applications we're using and stuff. But Sure. Yeah, or breaking it down. Like Deadline has a good uh, like jigsaw um, plugin that will break down uh, into the various parts and distribute it like that way, like setting your regions and, and putting it back together and stuff. So that was kind of what I remember what we used to do before uh, we were using Deadline sometimes. And yeah, quite the we have a part. system called Swarm in 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 uh, V-Ray, which is also yeah. Is that uh, yeah have you used to, that? On some to Maya now. I mean, I remember it was came out first for like Revit and stuff, right? For, it was uh, came out for SketchUp, I think. Yeah. SketchUp, yeah. Right. But it was basically like you just install it on all the computers and it'll just <laughs> it'll just right, swarm. Right. <laughs> so yes. that was uh, that, that was kind of an interesting idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I it was interesting. Like, I, I still you know distributed rendering is 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 a big is a big deal and sort of understanding that. So how I mean, obviously, you guys started with Mental Ray, right? That was the first renderer. So ray, ray tracing was always an important part of your process. Did you guys do any rasterized rendering? Are you looking at any re real time <laughs> rendering at this point? I mean, at the beginning, I remember when we were learning, like, it was crazy that people were using a rasterizer and like RenderMan. And obviously, all the films were like using it, and we were looking like, and the results were like amazing. But then when I studied it, we had like a little bit of time on to, to learn RenderMan. And I was like, this is ridiculous. Like, so many hacks to try and get. I mean, obviously, there's still hacks in the ray tracing and stuff and, and optimizations that were done, but like the hacks to do reflections and to do self reflections and, and things like that was was pretty crazy at the time. Uh, um, so it was always, always wanting to, to do uh, ray tracing and especially like interactive ray tracing. Like the IPR was a big thing and wanting to see like move a light kind of in real time. And back then it was, you know, a little bit slower and you just, yeah, you put your samples down quite a bit just to try and see it, but it was still kind of yeah what we needed to do on shots. And we were used to do like lighting, um, you know, lighting sessions with with a photographer or with the client at the same time. So you're moving a light, and 
doing it with them and and even back then it was still it was still still pretty good um for what it was at the time i think and uh we were trying to find like different applications to do that different renderers or different plugins for mental ray there was like rendition and and spray trace and and some other things and but because i was not i was still like my base i never really got over to 3ds max and you know there was like brazil and 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 other things like that and and obviously v-ray and yeah kind of didn't get to that that side of it but um now yeah now it's everything we we well we use us we use a renderer called vred predominantly here in, in our new york studio um which was bought by autodesk a while back but it's like a real-time ray tracer and it's like it's hard to go to go back to even Maya and v-ray just because there's like no there's no um not transition time i can't even remember the word but like assembly time in terms of uh press the render and it's got to load all the geometry and stuff like that into into right. memory and, and stuff like that and um you guys should try yeah. vantage vantage you can yeah well vantage. yeah <laughs> you can live link it's now it's the live link is better with 3ds max i'm not sure about you maya. can live link in maya like, we can live link like, in maya yeah i mean yeah. that was what we you can actually live link in you can live link in any application that supports distributed rendering in v-ray there's a little hack to make it work. So that's basically what you can do. Uh, okay, I can right, show right. you how to do that. <laughs> yeah, cool. yeah, that's definitely, yeah. A, definitely a thing. Cause yeah, I mean, when, I mean, I'll tell you right now, I can do it. Let's do it on a podcast. Yeah. So if you, want a live, <laughs> if you want a live link, what you do is you turn on distributed rendering in, in Maya or unreal, for example, right. Or whatever package you have. And then you put in, you have a, uh, uh, Vantage loaded and ready to go just on your on the side. And then uh, you want it to go to the local host machine, which is the same computer you have. So you turn on distributed rendering and you turn off use local machine. So that means it won't render in Maya, but it'll send right. it off and to your machine there. So the machine code for your machine is 127.001. Yeah. That's your IP address. And then the the uh, the port number for uh, for um, Vantage is two zero two zero seven zero one. So you do one twenty seven dot zero dot zero dot one colon two zero seven zero one, and it mm -hmm. goes right there, and then it live links beautifully. So you then <laughs> okay. keep working. You keep working in Maya while you keep working in Maya, and it just sh and it play and it shows it directly there. And so the hack for Maya version to make it mm -hmm. Live link faster is that you take you use one of your viewports and you do uh, the V-Ray uh, IPR rendering in that viewport, and that will make the that will make it work faster as across the board. So okay. it works great. Right. I've been doing it. Right. It's a little <laughs> hacky. Mm -hmm. uh, I know. I know. It's a little hacky for now because they're ironing out some yeah, things that they want it, on to want to make it work yeah. with like a proper button, you know? Right, but right, I was yeah. like, I want it now. And it's like, well, you can mm. hack it this way, Chris. And it's like, okay, yeah. great. So, mm -hmm. so I've been okay. doing that. I'll definitely give that a try. Um, yeah. yeah, that was a big We've, thing when we saw Vantage. Uh, yeah. That we, we just um, tried it in London as well on a, on a fairly complex scene with like a um, architecture with a car in front of it and just being able to just like you know you have read it read it glass panels and you're just moving with the camera through there yeah. seeing the glass in real time refracted and in it's basically a yamaya scene or having this sort of stuff where you like you play with reflections having a reflection in front of the car and you play with this double reflection that's the sort of stuff that when you just work with a viewport you can't do that you need to have this you need to be able to play and for that you need to be able to use real time and that's what kind of yeah. okay unreal of course we played a lot with as well but then for the final render quality output it's it's not what we need yet and um right. but this vantage thing is of course we were like wow this is this is amazing well, if we could use the, this but then it needs to be able to okay the changes that we do need do here we need to be able to go back to maya and it needs to be this back and forth and not a, a yeah. one-way street basically and but yep yeah, the potential is is huge. Well, live linking is definitely going to help you stay in mm -hmm. keep working in Maya. The right. other advantage is that you're still using V-Ray shaders. So your final render, if you want to do it in V-Ray, yeah. it's the same exactly. thing. Exactly. So, yeah. I mean, the thing that I love about real time uh, is that, um, you know, yes, obviously it's faster feedback, but it's, I want to be able to make decisions while my mouse button is still down. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> And then, yeah. and then instead of going up and down, up and down, up and down, up yeah. and down, I was like, D, E, E. And so 
you know, I used to do a lot of versions of things and I was like, I want to do actually infinite versions immediately mm-hmm. as I'm doing yeah. them and then clicking yeah. up, you know, and, and you, Christoph, you would remember, like I had this discussion with a, a VFX supervisor of mine who, uh, who used to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a DP, an onset DP, and mm-hmm. he was actually the onset DP for a bunch of the Star Trek uh, stuff and miniatures for mm. Star Trek and stuff. Yeah, cool. But he was saying the way that we, he said he saw how we were lighting in CG and he said it would be, it would be like me going on set, turning off all the lights, moving a camera around, moving the <laughs> lights around where they need to be, turning them on, wait half an hour to see what it looks like and then turning them all off yeah. and then doing it all yeah. over again. It's like, that's a nightmare. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> of course yeah. it takes you like three weeks to light a shot. <laughs> Yeah, I remember. I always was always curious because I I didn't really get into the the visual effects side in the end, and I was obviously on the advertising side with Christoph. And um, yeah, it's just like what you guys were doing back then in terms of lighting. It, it did seem not archaic, and obviously the results were amazing. But it was just like it did seem very slow and yeah, not interactive right. at all. And um, yeah, I was kind of I was always amazed by what we were sort of doing, and and but I guess it was yeah different amounts of different levels of, of well of stuff anything and- anything can look good if you have the right artist behind it and you willing to take the time to do it i mean look yeah. at jurassic park the first one right imagine think about what that computer was like back then oh, 30 yeah, exactly. plus years it's ago yeah i still love watching that movie so yeah yeah still, but still it, you know Spaz Williams was behind it and he was determined to make it look good. And, uh, he used up, you know, NURBS models of, of, uh, dinosaurs <laughs> and spotlights yeah, with shadow maps crazy. and it still looked great, <laughs> you know? So, um, so yeah, I think it's, that's the thing, right? It's just, if you have more time, but I think ray tracing, the thing to me that it happened is when ray tracing came along is that one person could do a whole lot more because they didn't have to hack so much stuff, you know? Is that, yeah, just physically plausible. Yeah materials and and things um was a was a big leap the mere material for us with immense rave and all the stuff from zap like yeah i mean used to read his blog every day as you're just trying to like message him on cg talk and stuff it was it was yeah huge huge helps and, and everything like that so it was it was pretty cool back then yeah Zap was just on recently on the no, I, podcast. I, I, I listen, yeah, yeah so. hard to watch in that, in that room if there's too much, too much light. <laughs> too much going on. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, so, okay, so we mentioned obviously you guys have done a lot of cars. What are some of the other areas that you guys have focused on recently? Ooh, a lot of like, yeah, CG worlds, a lot of okay. yeah, CG, yeah, CG, CG architecture in terms of, yeah, set builds and, Along those lines, um, yeah, a lot of general stuff. It's it's nice to not do cars all the time. Uh, I mean, most of these things are involving cars, and you're building sets to put these cars into and stuff like that. But um, yeah, we do like to <laughs> to do other things than cars and and to try and do more general stuff. But um, it does seem to fall back to cars. But yeah, the guys in London have done uh, done definitely a, a more variety of of things recently i'd say right yeah just finished yeah. the jewelry jewelry project um full cg animation um that was really interesting as well a few years in the making but we got there in the end um and then yeah but it is like a lot of the resources at the moment if we need to learn new stuff it is towards building entire environments landscapes um i think that's the one bit um <clears throat> where it is quite a learning curve but it's the resources are getting better and better um so we're really pushing a lot towards that um but then yeah i mean anything to do with fine art um fashion if there's some interesting projects out there we still really like to do all that sort of stuff um and also like yeah there's one photographer um Austrian photographer Clemens Ascher who he does a lot of fashion or people uh, fine art work, but then aiding it with CG elements that can be just, it can be sets, it can be props, it can be actually for the next projects part of the wardrobe, like really simple shapes as wardrobes that will then be CGI. And that's the sort of stuff that it's, yeah, it's just so nice though. I mean, we all kind of like cars, but then at the same time, it's nice to do something else. And it's also, it informs, (laughs) of course, it informs your commercial work as well, because you, it opens your horizon, your mind. And, um, 
and you get new ideas and you get all refreshed again. And it's, um, yeah, I think the CG artists that we have, they tend to be more really into cars and they're really some proper car geeks, um, which really yeah. helps because they are basically, I mean, they have to assemble the cars and they really have to know a lot about cars actually. Um, while on the post production side, it's actually a lot of people who, who enjoy cars, but, um, definitely appreciate having a person um, on their screen as well. So I want to real, real quick, cause I know we're running out of getting close on time and I want to get to talk a little bit. I was going through your website and I saw this mad love project that you guys did. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about that? <laughs> it's basically, it's basically our blog. Um, yeah. And it was um, about trying to, yeah give some more background information and also sometimes just we, there's one section that's just like stuff we like where it's just like great artists or work that inspires us and um, sometimes it's on set if you have like an interesting production where you're in a great location um, where it's just really interesting how a project came together and quite often or like for example this project um, this hockey this kind of yes space uh, motorbike um where yeah. then while we were working on it we didn't even know all this background information then we talked to the photographer who then put us in touch with the designer of this vehicle who then just gave us much more background information so it becomes even like um we have um a great woman um who's who's putting all these articles together for us and then she enjoys kind of digging into it and interviewing the people that were involved and when she then finishes an article and there's loads of stuff that even I might have been working on a project I didn't know about at all. Once I see it somehow, there's so much interesting background information that she manages to dig out. Um, and I think that's, it's great. It's quite often you forget about, um, what made a project actually fascinating. And quite often it's the hardship that you are kind of, in in this tunnel somehow where you're only like looking at a small part of, of of the project and it's the suffering part as well quite often but then afterwards in retrospect when you look at it even like years later somehow just like oh yeah let's look at that and that was involved and we made all these drawings and oh yeah we did all these tests how this ball was falling when you just that's interesting as well sometimes when you just and remind you somehow when you're not quite sure how would it work in cgi just like try to Try to test it in the real world. Just take a plastic bag and just like put it over the ground. What does it do in the, in the real world? How do physics work? Um, how do shadows fall? How do certain materials behave in the real world? And that's kind of like always like this reminder as well. Um, that's the fun part as well where you go like, okay, hey, um, let's try it. Let's build something. Let's glue some stuff together, build a contraption and, um, figure out what would happen if you were doing this, if you were doing this for real and, and that blog is really dedicated to all these um, interesting bits about a, about our job that um, quite often get forgotten. I think it's great. It definitely has uh, has a lot of uh, heart and feeling to it. That I think is it's mm. interesting because cool. it's, it's, it's great. I mean, you look because at your it's a little site. bit hidden as well. And I sometimes wonder it how is. many people actually hidden, do look I, at what, it. Yeah, because you look at your site and it's gorgeous. And you, you know, every mm. project you click on it, you have gorgeous picture after gorgeous picture yeah. after gorgeous picture. And this one's a little bit more dirty which mm -hmm. is a good thing, you know, and, and it has, it has uh, some narrative to it. And I think, I mean, I was yeah. just going through the story about that, 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 that was it the tardigrade motorcycle. Is that what it's called? That's yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it's really cool. <laughs> it's yeah. just like, it's like, yeah. what, what am I reading? Yeah. How did this yeah. happen? <laughs> yeah. You know? So it's just yeah. kind of a great experience. So, yeah. I mean, I think what you guys have done as a company is really interesting. Uh, and obviously mm. Thank uh, you. you guys are, are passionate about this stuff and are very successful. You've been at it for a long time. Uh, so it's really cool to see that. Um, and it, it be, before we sign off, is there anything that, you know, people can look forward to that you guys can do or any place that they can go to, to, to follow your work? I'm sure you have Instagrams and all of that stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, yeah, I mean, if you look for us, I think you'll, you'll find us on, on Instagram, on Behance as well, where we got quite a big followership. And sometimes Behance has become actually quite an important platform for us, um, where then sometimes even get posted, um, on Behance before they get posted on the website. And on Behance, there's usually a little bit of a write up about each project as well. Give it some, nice. some background information. Yeah. And then that's great. Yeah. 
I guess in the future is yeah just developing more and more the motion part where it, it's like where I think it's also for us interesting if we if we go into motion like for print you know we're just I'd like to think we're doing like top shelf work and if we go into motion I think we really want to make sure that we're really working on the same quality level and in Stuttgart we already have a film division um with like a, a DOP and Ari Alexa and they're just really turning out some great work already um also full CGI projects and and car commercials and I think it's it's something where we're just working in in the other branches to build up something similar as well and in London definitely looking looking for that I think in New York at some point as well because as I said it's just it's merging much more and I think this motion thing you have to build um a different pipeline for that as well and um so yeah if there's if any vfx supervisors are listening or something somebody wants to <laughs> run their own run their own ship we're, we're definitely looking for like some great collaborators who are willing to um yeah start something like that in london or new york as well like a recon farmhouse motion division um yeah Give us a shot, please. <laughs> That's great. Well, we'll definitely, yeah, we'll put that up there yeah. on, the, on the site that you guys yeah. are looking for, mm. for some some people. Mm. So that's really cool. Well, thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate you coming on and, and to talk about all the amazing things you guys are doing at Recom Home House because it's um, it's 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 great and it's really good to talk to you guys. And well, thank you, congratulations for having and continued us. Yeah, success. Me too. <laughs>